Catherine here. I'm a doctor of natural medicine and over the years, I've had the honor and privilege of helping countless CKD patients transform their lives. Some have managed to completely reverse CKD. Others with diabetes have seen dramatic improvements in their health. And yes, I've even worked with patients in advanced stages of kidney disease, helping them find hope where they thought there was none. And yes, even some of my patients in the most advanced stages were able to improve. But this isn't about me. It's about you. The reason I'm sharing this is because through my work, I've learned a few essential truths about what it takes to improve your GFR, lower your creatinine, and truly protect your kidneys. In fact, there are nine specific habits and actions that every single one of my successful patients has followed. And today, I'm going to share them with you step by step. Let's dive right in, starting with number nine, be knowledgeable about your diet. I was talking with one of my patients recently, and he was over the moon about the food I recommended. Why? Because for the first time in years, he could go to the bathroom every single day at the same time. And what was the magical food behind this transformation? Was it a remedy for constipation? A cactus? A berry? A fiber-packed superfruit? It was all of those things. Let me introduce you to pitaya, also known as dragon fruit. This incredible food is a cactus. It's a berry and it's a fiber powerhouse that's perfect for managing constipation. And trust me, my patient loves it. Now, pitaya is mainly grown in tropical regions like Mexico, South America, and parts of Asia. Now, I know it might not be available everywhere, but don't worry. There are plenty of other great options for managing constipation. And you might be wondering, what does constipation have to do with kidney disease? Well, actually a lot. You see, many of the toxins that damage your kidneys are expelled through bowel movements. If you're not going to the bathroom regularly, those toxins can build up and make your kidneys suffer. For example, uremic toxins like indoxyl sulfate and p cresyl sulfate are removed via bowel movements and it doesn't stop there. Excess phosphorus, nitrogen, sodium, and even potassium can accumulate if you are constipated. So yeah, that is my point, right? Understanding what foods are best for you, like this miraculous fruit is for my patient, can really make a huge difference with your kidney health. Yeah, knowledge is power. So if you think this info is useful, don't forget to click the like button and also share this video on social media so more people will get a chance to see it. Now, let's circle back to potassium since that's the reason why I suspected my patient was constipated in the first place. Number eight, let's talk about why managing potassium properly and not avoiding it altogether can be a game changer for your kidneys. Now, I know the moment I say high potassium foods, half of you are clutching your pearls and muttering, but the potassium, relax. I'm not asking you to bath in banana smoothies, but here's the kicker. My patient's borderline high potassium levels actually improved when he added pithaya, a high potassium food, to his diet. Incredible! How is that even possible? Did I wave a magic wand? Wingardium Leviosa. Did I bribe the potassium gods? Nope! It's simpler than that. I just followed the guideline for the treatment of hyperkalemia in CKD. Here's the truth they don't tell you. High potassium foods don't actually cause high serum potassium levels. I know, mind-blowing. Instead, the real culprits are things like constipation. 
Yes, I'm serious. Overdoing it on blood pressure meds or good old metabolic acidosis. Meanwhile, potassium-rich foods are just chilling in the produce aisle and getting all the blame. I mean, it's just like what we did in the 90s with cholesterol. Ah, your cholesterol is too high. You must be eating too many egg yolks. Nope, not how it works. And potassium is just the same. So while eating a banana a day doesn't cause hyperkalemia, constipation might, as well as high blood pressure and metabolic acidosis. And what's causing all these issues? Well, in many cases, not enough fruit and veggies in your diet. Now, let me be crystal clear. This is not your cue to start hoarding bananas, but restricting your diet to avoid high potassium foods should be the last resort, not the first. In fact, if constipation is part of the equation, as it was for my patient, reducing your intake of high potassium foods might actually make things worse, not better. There are many effective ways to bring down high potassium levels and they don't involve slashing healthy nutrient rich foods from your plate. Moving on. Number seven, let's talk about whole grains. Okay, here's something that always makes a big difference between patients that improve and those who don't. Eating whole grains. You know, stuff such as oats that are amazing for cholesterol or amaranth that fights high blood pressure and brown rice, a fiber-packed staple food that gets unfairly overshadowed by its white counterpart, which has the nutritional value of a paper towel. Look, we all know sugar is off the menu, so I won't sugarcoat it. You'll have to ditch a lot of foods when you start a renal diet, not just meat, but also most processed and packaged foods. Processed junk, gone. Fast food, bye-bye. Twinkies? Pack your bags. But here is the thing. Whole grains are your new best friend. Brown rice, bulgur, farro, barley, buckwheat, amaranth. You've got options and they're all packed with fiber, nutrients and health benefits. Plus, they don't come with a side of regret and a heartburn chaser. Actually, whole grains are healthy for you even if you have diabetes or if you are overweight, says science. Now here's the kicker, I recommend whole grains to all my patients and I've never had someone complain that they couldn't lose weight on my diet. Actually, the opposite happens. Most people following a low-protein, plant-based diet risk losing too much weight, too fast. Yeah, turns out the burgers, sodas, and pizzas were the culprits all along, not the bulgur. Shocking, right? Who could have seen that coming? By the way, when you lose weight, you also lose diabetes. If you still don't believe me, I have a simple experiment for you. First, get tested for creatinine, GFR, and proteinuria. Then, try one of those influencer-approved buzzword heavy diets, keto carnivore, or whatever nonsense is trending this week. Give it a month, measure your kidney function again, and marvel at how much worse it gets. Still here with me? Great. Now, try a low-protein, plant-based diet for a month, remeasure your kidney function, and watch the improvement. It's like magic, but with science. And hey, I'm telling you this for 100% selfish reasons. Yeah, right. Almost all my patients come to me after realizing my recommendations actually work. It's like a light bulb moment, but for your kidneys. So go ahead, try the keto diet first if you want. Just make sure you leave enough kidney function for me to fix. I mean, I'm good, but I can't resurrect kidneys from the dead. I'm a naturopath, not a necromancer. Okay, up next, let's talk about one of the biggest breakthroughs in the world of the renal diet. Number six, focus on antioxidants. Antioxidants, here's something we will hear about more and more often in the future because they can actually improve your kidney function. You really want as many as possible in your diet. And to do that, first of all, focus on colors. Foods that are red, purple, orange, or blue are often very rich in antioxidants. In fact, antioxidants give these foods their colors. Tomatoes, for example, are red due to lycopene, a carotenoid that protects the kidney cell from oxidative stress. 
Blue or purple foods such as blueberries and eggplants are usually rich in anthocyanins, very powerful antioxidants. Carrots, sweet potatoes, and some other orange and yellow foods are rich in beta-carotene. Even green foods such as peanuts, kale, broccoli are green due to an antioxidant, chlorophyll. This is a powerful detoxifier that helps the kidneys in more than one way. Remember that each of these antioxidants helps the kidneys and they all provide unique health benefits. Number five, let's talk about an antioxidant that everyone that has blown out more than 50 candles at their last birthday should take. I'm talking about cocutane. Now, coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10 is not just another antioxidant like lycopene or beta-carotene. In fact, while being low on these antioxidants is a serious issue as it will increase oxidative stress, you can't really have a deficiency. Now, CoQ10 is different. This is an enzyme that acts as a vitamin and while we can't really call it a vitamin since the body produces it, you can still be deficient in it. This mainly happens in people that are taking stunts and in those who are over 50. In fact, when your levels of CoQ10 are too low, you are going to experience serious symptoms, even inexplicable joint, bone and muscle pain and kidney damage. As we can read here, CoQ10 deficiency in kidney tissue results in nephrotic syndrome and renal dysfunction, which is like saying that no CoQ10 means no working kidneys. In, and in medical literature, it has been observed that a big number of people are deficient in this molecule. In fact, I usually recommend CoQ10 to everyone who is taking a stun or a beta blocker or in general to those over 50. Question, how do you take CoQ10? Well, take a look at the slide on screen right now. As you can see, selenium can help activate the antioxidant effect of CoQ10, making it more effective. So if you are supplementing selenium or if you are eating Brazil nuts for it, take CoQ10 at the same time. It's really going to help protect your kidneys and most of all, keeping those pesky free radicals at bay. And yeah, free radicals are bad. But do you know what's worse? Number four, phosphorus. Guys, make sure your phosphorus levels are always under control. No, your doctors aren't doing this for you. <sighs> phosphorus, the most misunderstood villain in the world of kidney disease. If this were a murder mystery, phosphorus will be the criminal everyone ignores while blaming the butler. Seriously, if I had a penny for every doctor who forgot to check the phosphorus levels of their stage 4 CKD patients, I'd have enough to buy my own health insurance company and deny them coverage for oversights. Here's the problem. No one talks about phosphorus. No one tracks it. No one treats it. It's like healthcare professionals collectively decided they can only have attention span for one mineral and potassium won the popularity contest. Meanwhile, phosphorus is out here ruining kidneys and giving zero apologies. Unchecked, phosphorus levels will destroy your thyroid faster than you can say levothyroxine and harden your arteries into cement sculptures. If that wasn't enough, it's also the main reason CKD patients develop itchy skin in the advanced stages. So, how do we stop this phosphorus nightmare? First of all, get tested. Fun fact, most patients aren't even being tested for phosphorus, which is just like skipping the engine check while your car makes weird noises. Brilliant! And then, even if your levels are fine, cut phosphorus from your diet. This comes from two sources, animal-based foods and from packaged foods. Now, with animal-based foods, things are simple you just avoid them but with packaged foods it's trickier these sneaky devils hide phosphorus additives like they're smuggling contraband become a food label detective and avoid anything with phosphoric acid sodium polyphosphate pyrophosphate polyphosphate or anything else with phos in it no amount of this is safe if you care about your kidneys Okay, moving on. Number three, let's talk about the only other common issue CKD patients have that's even more misunderstood than phosphorus. Drumroll, please. Number three is anemia. Guys, always keep 
anemia under control. Seriously, guys, there is no improving without getting enough treatment for anemia. If I had a penny for every patient who was already being treated for anemia before seeing me, I'd have two cents, maybe three on a good day. Yeah, it's that bad. Fact. If you have CKD, your chances of having anemia are more than 50% if you are a man and more than 70% if you are a woman. And anemia isn't just some I'm feeling a little tired kind of problem. It's a full-blown wrecking ball for your kidneys. When I get a new patient, one of the first things I check is their hemoglobin levels. Why? Because if you're anemic and you're not treating it, your kidney function isn't going up. For sure. It's like trying to climb Mount Everest in flip flops. On the flip side, anemia is treatable. Fix it, and suddenly you'll feel like you've been plugged into a charger full of energy and ready to take on the world. Oh, and your kidneys will also start functioning better. So, what's the problem? The problem is that doctors aren't prescribing treatment adequately. It's scary how often this gets overlooked. So what to do? Step one, get tested. Keep an eye on your iron and hemoglobin levels. Step two, treat it. Vitamin B6, vitamin B9, and B12. Iron supplements if needed. And don't wait until you're dragging yourself around like a zombie to take action. Remember guys, anemia is like driving on reserve fuel. Ignore it long enough and you'll be stranded in the middle of nowhere with nothing but regrets. You know, the lack of proper treatment for anemia isn't just frustrating, it's a call to action. Anemia is far too common in CKD patients, yet it's often overlooked or undertreated. This brings us to our number two. This is one of the best pieces of advice I can give you. Number two, be your own advocate, because I know what you might be thinking right now. Catherine, we are not the one who should be lectured about this. Our doctors should. Or even better, those come insurances that are denying our treatment. Yeah, of course you are right. But listen to this. There is this thing called patient advocacy in the medical world. And I think you should really know about it. The way it works is simple. You get informed. You learn about yourself. Then when you are in front of your doctor, you know exactly what to ask for and how to push for it. Patient advocacy is all about becoming an active participant in your own care rather than a passive observer. The truth is, no one knows your body better than you do and no one has a greater stake in your health than you. When you educate yourself about your condition, whether it's understanding the symptoms of kidney disease, the tests you need, or the treatment option available, you're empowering yourself to ask the right questions. Challenge decisions that don't feel right and demand the care you deserve. And trust me, this is way more important than you realize. For example, if you know that anemia is wrecking your energy levels and harming your kidney function, you can insist on getting your hemoglobin levels checked regularly. If they are low, you can advocate for iron supplements, vitamin therapies, or even EPO injections if necessary. You'll know what to request and you'll feel confident pushing back if you're told to wait and see. Not to mention that patients who actively participate in their care always have better outcomes. Yes, this is how important it is to learn about your own health. Speak up, ask questions, and don't settle for anything less than the best care for your kidneys. Speaking of which, let's talk about my number one for today. This is the most effective diet on earth when it comes to improving kidney function. No, it's not the low protein diet. There is something even more effective. It's called a very low protein diet. <laughs> Wait, what? There is a very low protein diet now? And it's even better than the regular old low protein diet? Well, actually, the very low protein diet is not for everyone. It comes with certain risks, but it's true that it is even more effective against CKD than the regular low protein diet. And don't worry, you can learn everything about it from my video. It's up here and this is all for today. Thank you for watching. God bless you all. Bye bye.